All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Fallon, and I'm a policy manager working on transportation policy at the Bay Area Council. And thank you for joining us for another installment of our Bay Area Impact COVID-19 series, where we speak with business leaders, elected officials, economists, and other experts on the wide region effects of our current global health crisis. Today, our focus is on our region's transportation system and public transit agencies, which have come to a screeching halt as shelter-in-place orders shut down the economy to stop the spread of COVID-19. Ridership on many systems is down 80% or more, and this is having a devastating financial impact on these systems as tolls, fares, and other revenue sources dry up. And now we're starting to see the Bay Area slowly reopen, but the recovery is likely to be slow, uneven, and painful. So today we're going to talk with leaders of five of the region's key transit and transportation agencies to hear about these impacts, plans for reopening the system, what changes we can expect to see, and how these systems are survive, will survive. So please welcome Therese McMillan, Executive Director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, Seamus Murphy, Chief Communications Officer for the San Mateo County Transit District, Robert Powers, General Manager of BART, Rick Ramassier, General Manager of County Connection, which is a public transit service in, that serves Central Contra Costa County, and Jeffrey Tumlin, Director of Transportation for SFMTA. And first, I just wanna start by saying a huge thank you to all of you for participating in this, but also for your ongoing partnership with the Bay Area Council, all of you have been really crucial partners in helping us advance and achieve our transportation policy goals, including many, many hours that you committed to um, the Faster Bay Area effort, which we were leading earlier this year. So to kick us off, I'm gonna pass this over to our panelists for opening remarks, but we wanted to spend the majority of the time on questions from our audience. So please type your questions in the Q&A box below. So if you hover to the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A box pop up. Um, and we will do the best as we can to get to um, as many as the questions throughout this time. And if you would also like us to recognize the company that you represent, just please write that down when you ask your question. So to start, I'm going to hand it over to Teresa McMillan, Executive Director, Executive Director of MTC. Great. Okay, thank you so much, Kelly. And uh, thanks to all of you as we're here in our eighth week of Shelter in Place. And I'm happy to do a bit of table setting, I think, for the panel today. Um, I, you know, there's so much that could be covered. So in three minutes, you know, you can appreciate it'll be sort of illustrations of what's been going on with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the region generally. I think I would start by saying that the actions and planning that are taking shape in the region for public transport, for transportation generally, are really falling into three areas. Response, which is really all about survival generally. Um, recovery, which is really beginning to move toward a stabilization of, of where we are. And then what I call reshaping, which is going to be adapting to this new normal, which is still evolving even as we speak. And so trying to prepare to be in that space is an, is an important third tier, I think, in terms of what we're all seeing. With respect to response, let me give a, a couple of quick um, and co complementary examples, uh, starting with the bridges. Um, uh, overnight, literally, on March the 20th, we, BATA, the Bay Area Toll Authority, working with Caltrans, pulled all of the toll operators off of the bridges. Um, this was in response to the uh, governor's directive that we needed to um, deal uh, and with and, and mitigate the exposure of toll collectors as well as the toll paying public to the COVID-19 crisis. So we went all electric tolling overnight. And one of the interesting things for us is it's been working fairly well. Um, a lot of lessons learned from that experience, but it's an example of how this might be setting the table again, to use that term, as to how, how are we gonna price you know, going forward? How do we come back from this and, and, and perhaps accelerate all electric tolling as a strategy um, going forward? Um, as well, we suspended all payment on the express lanes that are happening right now. So on the road system, sort of suspension of pricing has happened and how we come back from that's gonna be quite interesting. On the transit side, on the response, the survival mode, um, we led, an incredible effort uh, with our transit partners. I would say unprecedented for the Bay Area in terms of the uh, coordination and rapidity that we pulled together to um, get out of the door the 
our share of the $25 billion that Congress had uh, made available through the First Care Act for emergency um, response for, trans for public transit. Uh, 1.3 billion was assigned to the Bay Area on April 22nd. The MTC got out about 60% of that. Again, in an unprecedented level of, of coordination that my partners can speak to uh, who are here today, among others. But importantly, kind of pivoting to this notion of the second bucket, which is recovery. Um, the commission also set up a blue ribbon transit uh, recovery task force, anticipating that how transit agencies um, come back from what Kelly mentioned is between a 70 and 90 plus loss of transit ridership and the resultant service adjustments that it happened. How do we come back from that? What does that look like? Not only on the financial end of how we get the second tranche out and the different perspectives and information we have about how revenue streams are reacting in this um, economic crisis, but also this notion of what does public transit and public mobility look like in this recovery? Not only our transit systems, but the interactions with biking and walking and telecommuting, all of which are very different in this current circumstance. And what are we learning from that? Um, Micromobility first, last mile, is it first, last all the time? I mean, it'll be really, I, I think, a challenge to work through what a new environment for public transit is gonna look like as we stabilize. And particularly with ridership that is now, going, riders that will be viewing things through a public health lens, which is incredibly different than how we've approached safety, for example, in the past. Let me end with reshaping and just introduce this concept and perhaps we can talk about it which is how do we adapt in the longer term? What's the long game in response to COVID-19? And fortuitously, MTC is leading Plan Bay Area 2050, an update to our 30 year long range plan where these questions are now front and center and we are having to pivot on how we are approaching these questions. The big four, how we travel, where we live, how do we co um, contribute to uh, uh, the economy, who we are as a people in the Bay Area. All of those in some ways are being reset now, real time. And how our long range plan takes up those questions in the short term, but realizing where we're going in the future probably has a more stable perspective insofar as we've been planning for uncertainty from the very beginning. So it'll be an interesting ride. I'll end it there. Um, and look forward to the questions and dialogue as we go forward. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks so much, Therese. Um, so next, I'm going to hand it over to Jeffrey Tumlin, Director of Transportation for SFMTA. Hi, I'm Jeff Tumlin, and at SFMTA, we not only carry typically about half of the transit riders in the region, but we also manage all of the streets of San Francisco. Um, and as Therese just said, um, from the very beginning, um, we have had to plan for the unexpected. So starting in late March, uh, we took a radical resiliency approach, knowing that a lot of change was about to hit us, but having no idea what that change was going to be or when it was going to hit. Um, so one of the key things that we saw right away is that as a result of the demographics of our frontline workers, we were experiencing what ended up becoming about 40% uh, of our frontline staff being out on COVID-related leave. Uh, and so in order to prepare for uh, unexpected number of our critical frontline workers showing up, um, we uh, eliminated three quarters of our 70 odd bus routes, stripping the system down to what is now about its 15 most essential lines, the transit lines that were carrying the most passengers uh, despite radical changes to ridership patterns, uh, that were serving all of our key institutions, particularly hospitals, uh, and very importantly, serving the communities uh, where people lived who had the fewest choices. So taking a strong equity approach. Um, we're now starting to enter the recovery phase, um, which is presenting remarkable opportunities despite the complete catastrophic disaster uh, that our workforce and our budget um, are experiencing. 
So we want to make sure that we bring the transit system back thoughtfully and not necessarily the way that it was before. Most importantly, we need to understand that transit is the fundamental underpinning of the regional economy. That if the region retreats in a fear-based way to driving cars to all destinations, economic recovery is impossible simply because of the geometry of mobility. It takes up 10 times as much roadway space to move somebody in a private car than in any other mode of transportation. And if transit doesn't work, half of the economy cannot come back because the streets simply can't move the people to their workplaces. So how do we make people unafraid of using public transit again? We've been particularly inspired by collaborating with cities like Taipei and other East Asian democracies um, that have successfully reopened their economies, kept COVID transmission rates at near zero, and are experiencing transit ridership levels at 80% of normal, um, largely because they rigidly enforce facial covering uh, our rules for all passengers. They do public temperature checking, uh, and they're putting forward a huge amount of effort to keep people safe using the best practices that science has available uh, to make transit work. We also know that this is a remarkable time to really invest in walking and biking while roadway volumes are down. Um, it takes up about the same amount of roadway space to move somebody on foot or on a bike as in a bus. Uh, and so we're investing heavily, uh, inspired by the remarkable work of the Oakland Department of Transportation in slow streets, uh, connecting uh, all San Francisco neighborhoods and connecting uh, the neighborhoods that had their transit service stripped away, allowing people to be able to walk safely a longer distance uh, in order to access transit. Uh, we're also collaborating a lot with the private sector, uh, which is struggling as much as we are, to try to see what we can do in order to allow bike share, scooter share, uh, and other services to work. Um, this is also an interesting opportunity for us um, to help um, the taxi industry survive uh, by helping them to focus on customer service and particularly better accessibility for people, uh, for older adults and people with disabilities, something that Uber and Lyft uh, are not doing a good job with, but taxis remarkably are. And of course, doing a thousand other things we can talk about in a few minutes. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, so next, I'm gonna turn it over to Robert Powers, General Manager of BART. Good morning, uh, Bob Powers. I'm the General Manager at BART. So I would say a couple of opening remarks here. So um, first, BART continues to provide safe and reliable transportation um, throughout the Bay Area. Um, and I think that is a, it's a, um, a statement that I, I wanted to lead off with about the importance of safe and reliable transportation in these times right now. We continue to move the, the mission critical, the, the folks that are responsible, um, the frontline employees at the healthcare system, the grocery stores um, that are um, riding the system, the folks that are transit dependent, and we're out there um, providing that service um, both safely and reliably. And I think that's important um, as this discussion goes on and um, we tie transit and its importance to the economy and the recovery, the importance of safe, reliable transportation. Um, so I wanted to say that uh, first off. The second piece um, I wanted to say is, um, I think the first two speakers spoke about it um, and touched on it, it's that for us to do that, it's the safety of our frontline employees to do that. So I don't operate a train. Um, I was out in the system today um, at three stations in the East Bay, um, walking through, talking to the frontline employees. They're out there, the trains are looking good, but we need our frontline employees to remain safe and healthy. And that's you know working collaboratively together to make sure that um, all the safety mechanisms are in place, whether it's the social distancing, the face masks, the PPEs. Um, so I think BART's done a very good job at both of those um, in keeping um, safe, reliable transit going in the Bay Area. I wanted to pivot on two other points. Um, so the Bay Area economy, I would argue, and this is the, the Bay Area Council, so we have some very smart uh, folks here, 
um, and from the community and the business community is very regional in nature. And so whether it's the workforce, whether it's transportation, whether it's housing, um, whether it's from a sustainability feature, it is a very, very regional um, natured economy. Um, and to crosswalk that to BART, BART is the underpinning of the Bay Area's transportation system. You know, it is regional in nature. We're running uh, somewhere about 122 miles of rail. Um, we're soon to be, very soon to be in five counties, um, 50 plus stations, and we go through 28 different communities. And that's the regional nature, the connectivity piece that we need to, as um, uh, Therese, the, the CEO of um, MTC was saying, as we recover, you know, making sure that we're out, transportation, public transit is out to serve the communities um, and to provide um, access is, is very important. The other piece I'll just hit on briefly is that BART really is at the intersection of land use and transportation. Um, and as you know, we recover as uh, the Bay Area, as a nation, as a, as a world, um, I think the opportunity to, to um, make sure that we collectively don't lose sight of the importance of that intersection of land use and transportation and um, making those lands around, whether it's a BART facility or, or a, a Caltrain facility or some other facility, you know, complete communities and making it easy for people to take public transportation. Um, and I'll speak for BART I, as I'm, I'm representing BART, you know, the importance of BART on the affordable housing piece right now, um, as we look forward and implementing AB 2923, you know, we have a significant amount of projects going right now on affordable housing in our development. We have a bunch planned and a bunch in the future. So that, that effort needs to keep going as, you know, we, we turn the corner and come out of this and look forward. So um, I'll leave it there and turn it back over to Kelly. Great, thank you so much, Bob. Um, so next we have Seamus Murphy, Chief Communications Officer for the San Mateo County Transit District. Thank you, Kelly. Um, uh, just a little bit about the transit district. We do administer the Caltrain commuter rail service. Uh, we also touch on other multimodal uh, aspects. Uh, we have our Sam Trans bus service that we operate in San Mateo County, and we administer about $200 million in transportation sales tax funds um, that are focused on bike and pedestrian improvements, streets and roads, highway improvements. Um, all of the aspects of those businesses are going to be affected by this crisis, but I want to focus on, on Caltrain uh, because I think Caltrain has a unique set of characteristics that make it especially vulnerable to what we're going through now. Uh, number one, Caltrain's the, the only uh, agency, the only system in the, in the region that doesn't have a dedicated source of funding. Uh, we're highly dependent on fares uh, and this uh, crisis has really exposed uh, that vulnerability. Um, three quarters of our riders are choice riders, uh, which means from a, a, a ridership decline perspective, we've seen over 90% uh, ridership decline uh, as a result of the pandemic and the shelter in place orders. Um, that uh, means that Caltrain is going to be in survival mode uh, for probably a longer period of time while other systems around the, the region hopefully will be talking about recovery and how best to plan for that and how to implement that. Uh, Caltrain is going to need to focus on survival uh, because of the, the fair revenue dependence and the lack of a dedicated source of funding. Um, I could truly say that without the CARES Act funding, uh, we would be um, really uh, hard pressed to maintain our system and to, and to maintain uh, the core services that we're operating right now for the thousands of essential workers that are still relying on Caltrain to get to their jobs and to do the work that they need to do. Um, we owe a great deal of thanks to Speaker Pelosi, uh, number one, for being able to shepherd through uh, those funds that have come to the Bay Area and also to Therese and, and MTC. Um, 
I remember an APTA uh, seminar after the uh, CARES Act was approved and they specifically talked about the work that California and the Bay Area had done from an advocacy perspective to make sure that transit is taken care of uh, in the CARES Act. And I know that's because of the, the work that uh, we all did and, and led by MTC pulling together to make that happen. Um, we've done all of the things that other agencies have done, in, in, including cutting service down to a, a bare minimum. Um, one of the challenges that um, the CARES Act funding um, uh, presents and includes, I guess, is that uh, uh, while we're receiving those funds, um, it, it's allowed us to maintain service, it's allowed us to maintain staffing, and the expectation is that uh, while agencies are receiving those funds, they will maintain those staffing levels and not conduct layoffs or furloughs. Uh, we're taking that to heart, to heart. We're planning on an FY21 budget that maintains uh, that core level of service and also maintains those staffing levels. And it means that uh, we're anticipating about a 22 to $66 million FY21 shortfall. Um, that's out of a 170 million total operating budget. So it's significant. Uh, and it our ability to manage that is gonna depend on uh, what the second tranche of CARES Act funding looks like um, as it's allocated throughout the region. It will depend on uh, supplemental relief efforts that hopefully will be coming from state and federal sources um, to carry us through what we know will be a difficult operating environment. Um, one thing that I just wanted to mention specifically is that we are um, working closely with our uh, corporate partners, our employers along the Caltrain line uh, to understand how they're going to recover from this. Um, our success, our ridership is going to be highly dependent on how those uh, companies ask employees to come back to work, whether uh, they will be uh, encouraging them to take transit and make transit a part of their commute again. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing whatever we can to make people comfortable getting back onto Caltrain and back onto transit generally as uh, things open back up. Uh, so we've uh, sent a survey out to our GoPass companies. Those are the companies that, are part that participate in uh, an annual pass program. Uh, we have 122 companies along the Caltrain corridor that do that, and hopefully we'll get some productive information that will help inform our planning efforts moving forward. Um, uh, and I think everybody hopefully saw uh, the report out of the Nashville, out of Nashville yesterday that talked about um, what uh, urban areas will look like if people don't get back onto transit. They had the Bay Area as the number one most vulnerable uh, region in terms of traffic congestion if people decide to uh, use uh, an automobile instead of getting back onto transit. I think it was uh, an additional 42 minutes of uh, delay if just one out of every four uh, former transit riders decides to not tra take transit when things open back up. Those are, that's something we should really be concerned about and pay a lot of attention to as, uh, as we uh, open things back up and, and continue to recover our systems. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks so much, Seamus. And finally, to wrap up our opening remarks, I am passing it on to Rick, Rick Ramasir, General Manager of County Connection. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm just going to kind of touch on some more of a, a localized flavor. Uh, county Connection operates 121 fixed route buses in Central County and another 55 paratransit vehicles, and we do not have responsibility for planning for the county's transportation system. That's a separate sister organization. So we're, we're a little bit unique here on this group of folks in that we're, we're sort of focused more on just delivering the transit. Like my colleagues, we've experienced a big drop in ridership, 80% or more on our fixed route service. Uh, at our peak two weeks ago, half of our operator workforce was out sick. Um, many on the FEMLA um, opportunities that have been handed to us uh, as part of COVID-19. Uh, we have a number of employees that have kids at home who aren't going to school, so they used FEMLA to stay home with their children. They're now starting to come back to work, and we are now in a position where we're looking at how do we move forward, and I'm going to focus a little bit on that. Um, and the aspect that we're really debating inside the agency really in the near term is social distancing. How do we accommodate social distancing relative to ridership coming back? and being attractive to folks so they will use transit when they start to go back to work. Because under our current county's order, as well as guidance from the CDC, 
we are supposed to keep our passengers six feet apart on the vehicle. Um, and if we do that, in some cases, meeting the same demand that we had in January with the same number of vehicles and the same number of employees will be uh, a very interesting challenge. And so moving, as we move forward through the summer and things start to open up, uh, we, are, we are wondering how we're gonna do this. And when you bring it down to a local level that we tend to focus in on at County Connection, um, some of the things we're gonna have to grapple with is the, the fact that pre-COVID, about a third of our ridership were folks under the age of 18, primarily using the bus to go to and from school. And those buses would often have 40 to 60 kids on a bus, depending on what level of school we're talking about. That's obviously not social distancing. As the schools open up, we don't know how they're going to do that. And that's going to impact on what we're able to do and how we plan for that. So that's something we're looking into. As you now move out to the region, um, we're very dependent on BART in terms of our ability to contribute to the region. In other words, as BART goes, so do we. So as Bob works on his system, and gets more service out there as we move forward, we'll have more demand on our buses to connect with BART. And that will create its own challenges, again, relative to social distancing. If we're sending more buses over to cover the school trippers at 8 a.m. because of social distancing, because of local demands, that's less resource we'll have to feed BART at that same moment in time. So those are some of the challenges we're looking towards in the medium term that I like to call the medium term uh, that are, are really quite interesting. Um, longer term towards the recovery, I think I see an opportunity if we're all able to grab it, as Jeff sort of alluded to, as we rebuild our systems and we recover and we grapple with resource uh, shortages and so forth, are we going to use that as an opportunity to build a system that better suits where we're going um, right now and where we're headed as a region uh, versus where we've been? Because I suspect the world's gonna look different a year from now than it did in January as economic activity rebounds and shows up in different places and not in other places. So I think that's more of a regional challenge. And again, our role in that is feeding the BART system largely. Uh, and again, as BART recovers, we'll have to figure out how we best serve BART. Uh, but right now in, the, in the, the short term, we're really kind of starting to grapple with this whole concept of social distancing and how does that work on public transit as riders come back. Great, thank you so much, Rick, and everyone else for your opening remarks. Um, so we have a lot of questions coming in regarding safety on transit and how you're going to ensure certain things like social distancing and just really making people feel safe ride transit again. So I'm gonna to try to merge a few of the questions here. Um, one you know, specific thing uh, brought up from Allison Rose from Autodesk was how can employers get up-to-date information from transit agencies on the protections transit systems are putting in place to protect riders. It would be helpful to be able to share with our employees as we open offices. So, you know, I think if uh, a lot of you can get into some of the specific programs and things that you're doing, and then also how you're gonna be sharing that information, it would be really helpful. Um, and I'd like to start um, by turning this over to Jeff because I know you also recently launched the COVID-19 ambassador program to help riders follow safety precautions. So we'd like to get a little more information about that and other um, efforts that you're taking. So for our efforts, just go to sfmta.com slash COVID. Uh, we're updating our uh, public information basically on a daily basis because that's how rapidly things are changing. Uh, of course, we are cleaning all of our vehicles before every shift. So that means our vehicles get cleaned three times a day. Uh, and most surfaces that folks touch are also getting cleaned uh, regularly. Of course, our operators are protected that our vehicles all have a a security barrier that protects the health of our operators, which is why um, unique among transit agencies, so far we have had zero cases that we've been able to identify of workplace transmission of COVID. Um, we're incredibly fortunate, uh, particularly given the experience of our peer agencies around the country. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Bob um, Powers if you'd like to add anything to that question. Um, just a couple of, uh, you know, the same, I w we do the same. Um, many transit agencies have learned from best practices. So, um, you know, when our trains come in at end of line, um, whether it's during the day or midday or at peak hour at night, we're wiping them down. And then at night they give a thorough cleaning every night. Um, 
so the trains and same thing in the stations, any touch, high touch point system uh, gets wiped out on a, on a very regular basis. The other thing that we've done now is we're really um, focusing on uh, the face masks right now in the system. And so we have signage at every uh, entrance to every BART station, every 50 of our stations at our, our Fairgate arrays that a face mask is required. It's not recommended, it's required to come into the BART system. Um, we have that uh, messaging in, from the train operators on the trains and on the DMS signs in the stations on the platforms. The other thing we're doing is we are migrating to more of a fixed post with our BART police de deployment strategy. And what that has allowed us to do, let's pick on me, is if, they, if I come into the system and I don't have a mask, um, BPD um, says, hey, Powers, you need to put your mask on. Um, and you know, not, you know, they're not out there, you know, writing citations or anything. So just, hey, to come into the BART system, you need to wear a mask. Um, and probably 95% of the people have masks. You know, they may be walking up to the system and it's down around their neck or around their head or something like that. But they put their mask on and go in or they'll grab someone out of their back, something out of their backpack. So I was, I, I was earlier before the, the, the thing started today, um, I was out in the system and I, you know, the folks riding the train, you know, more than 95% have the mask on. The people coming into the system even higher than that. So I think that it's working pretty good. Um, on educating the public to, you know, to ride public transportation, you need a mask. I think what we need to focus on a little bit is to make sure that that's a uniform thing. So um, that SFM, if somebody's going to jump on the BART system and then connect to Jeff's system, you know, mask on our system, mask on Jeff's system. Same thing if Rick's sending people, it's, it's uniform that everybody knows. You leave the house, you got your phone, you got your wallet, you got your, you know, and you got your mask, right? It's just, you know, something that we ought to be thinking about in the future like that. Anyway, that's my two cents on that. Yeah, thank you very much, Bob. Um, and Seamus, I also want to give you the opportunity to um, respond to that question as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I, I would just reiterate, I think uniformity across the systems is, is really important. We need to set a, a regional expectation for uh, what, uh, how transit will look, what kind of requirements will exist uh, when people want to use transit. Um, I think there's another possibility that maybe some um, cleaning technologies might come out of this that, uh, that are new, uh, that might uh, be able to be a little more robust and uh, be more permanent, not permanently, but semi-permanent antiviral technologies that could um, give us an opportunity to provide even more assurance to our riders that uh, transit is a safe environment for them to uh, to uh, be in uh, over that time as we recover. Uh, and then th the longer term social distancing requirements and mask requirements and any other additional requirements like mandatory temperature checks by our, our uh, operators and, and employees. Those are things that uh, we know are coming from a regulatory standpoint. We're monitoring that uh, regularly. And, and, and I think um, we uh, just need to have an open dialogue with regulators and, uh, and have an advocacy presence from the region as those decisions are made because they will affect how uh, we're able to recover and and how confident uh, transit riders will be when, when they're able to return to our systems. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that, Seamus. Um, Rick, I also want to ask you the same question, but add a bit of um, more context onto that. So, you know, you mentioned that your, your service, you know, you provide service to a lot of parts of the region that aren't necessarily, you know, the, they don't have as much access to transit, especially the larger transit systems. Um, and, and one question we got from Dave Sorrell from UC Berkeley was what efforts locally and regionally are agencies undertaking with employers region-wide to ensure that systems are safe, but also applying an equity lens to mobility solutions? Um, I thought that was, you know, I think would be particularly interesting to hear from you, Rick. So if you can please answer that. Sure. Uh, on the, on the uh, you know, the safety factor um, and how, how people can find out, we, we, like everyone else, you can go to our website and what will pop out right away is a COVID link about all the things we're doing uh, relative to COVID, service-wise, how to clean the how we're cleaning the buses, how we're outfitting our employees with PPE, how we're trying to enforce the county's order that people who board buses wear masks. Um, I'll move on quickly to the the equity versus um, 
you know, serving businesses, the business community, and so forth. Uh, that's exactly what we're looking at right now is as, as we ramp service down to meet how many employees are here and then as we start to ramp up as they come back to work, uh, we have developed what we call a planning hierarchy, hierarchy that has a number of factors built into it, including equity. And um, we are a fairly transit dependent based system. In other words, about 70% of our ridership can be classified as transit dependent depending on which metrics you're using to measure that. And we're very aware of that. So for example, in the Monument Corridor in Concord, our ridership is still a little higher than it's been in other places because essential workers, sadly, are often at the lower end of the economic scale. So the folks working at Safeway and at Costco and at the lower end of the healthcare system are living in those sorts of areas, say, versus La Mirinda. And so, not to pick on anybody, that ridership's been a little bit higher. And as we look towards ramping up service and as we look towards maintaining social distance, distance requirements, we will be looking to make sure that those folks get the services they need as much as we'll be looking at what does it mean when say our business, our biggest business park, Bishop Ranch reopens up and those folks tend return to work there. There's two or three buses per day in the morning that we send to Bishop Ranch that are full. If all those folks come back, and we have to practice social distancing, we'll have to weigh that in with the, the other concerns of other areas of our service area that if we don't deliver service, they have no way to get around. So that's a very important question for us and one where we're talking regularly every day about how to, how to attack successfully as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that, Rick. Um, so staying on this theme, I'm gonna direct the next question to Therese. We have a question from Hans Corby from Corby Consulting saying MTC has an opportunity to require face masks on all transit as part of the next phase of distributing federal dollars. For transit riders to come back to the systems, masks are an essential element of protecting the health of the passengers and the transit operators. Is MTC prepared to do that or thinking along um, doing something along those lines? So one of the things that, I mean, we heard that commentary um, when we took up the first and second tranche and uh, sort of blending what my colleagues have just said, each operator is having to lead in this space in terms of what to put together. Um, they are the operators on the front lines. They are the ones that, for example, have to find and secure and procure all this PPE, which, is, which has been no small task that they've, they've had to face as the demand for that you know, has been really extraordinary. Um, we, uh, the commission directed us to inventory what's happening across the region. Um, I think getting that data and information is the first very important element. And quite frankly, um, the consistency question that my colleagues raised, I think is one that we can help facilitate in terms of a longer overall um, approach to how safety is being viewed in this recovery effort. Um, because if the systems interconnect, the protocols need to be consistent and interconnect as well. And so I think we play a really you know, critical role there. Um, it will be part, I think, of the palette of considerations that align with tranche two, but you know, not, not a singular one. And I think most importantly, what we want to do is have a much keener sense of the financial ramifications that our operators are having to put forward. Again, as, as my colleagues just said, one of the things that's important about safety is also the social distancing. How long is that gonna be in place? What does it mean in terms of accommodating that? Um, creating that distance is either temporal, like you run a lot more service so that you've got more you know, more options for people to travel in any particular time, or it's physical. You actually have longer trains or buses that are, you know, tagged together. That has a cost. And mm -hmm. how our different transit operators are going to look at those options and what that cost translates into and how that lines up with the revenue streams, I think is an also a very important part of this larger, multi-layered, more complex, view of what increasing and maintaining safety for our public transit operators means. That's the role I think where MTC will be 
most valuable is having, having to coordinate the right questions, the responses, and the consistency in terms of moving forward. Great. Thank you, Therese. Um, and if you'll mind, I'll like to stick with you for the next question. Um, it's the first one that we got in from Dion Lim from ABC7 News. And he asked that he'd like to know what the future of casual carpool is and what the future looks like for toll plazas and you know, requiring human contact. So I think anything along casual carpool, your other van pool programs that NTC runs. Well, I guess I, you know, I got, I'll start with that. I had opened with, with really that look. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's going to be quite interesting for us is how, um, how bringing back toll payers works in the region. Um, we're working very closely with Caltrans, who um, is the one who uh, employs the, the toll takers. That is a role that the state has through the State Department of Transportation. And um, we are working very closely with them on what that would mean. Of course, the safety of the toll takers is going to be a paramount considerations as, you know, our, for the very same things as our bus drivers and our, our rail operators need to be looked at. So that's all in the mix. I think what we, though, want to do is bring in the lessons learned of how this all electric toll taking is working, again, in terms of just the day to day, seems to be working relatively smoothly. Um, quite frankly, for bad of the Bay Area Toll Authority, the increased um, uh, transactional requirements of now having to basically invoice people who are going through to get the toll because we've not suspended the tolls is a practical matter that we are working through and we're, and we're learning more what that infrastructure will look like, will be, which will be essential to develop. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, um, again, I think it's an opportunity to learn from the current laboratory we're in right now and how that, you know, it, it will be something we'll be working with our, um, you know, commission as to how to potentially transition into an all electric toll future, um, which has a lot of layers to it. And, um, you know, stay tuned for that. It's one of the high things that is being highlighted out of this COVID, uh, post COVID perspective we're bringing to bear. Yeah, great. Thank you for that, Therese. Um, so I'm seeing a few questions um, about the program or about the efforts in Taipei that Jess mentioned. So just generally hoping to get more information from you about, you know, the learnings from Taipei, um, what efforts they took that you think we can learn from. So uh, you can get uh, a lot of detail by going to cdc.gov.tw. Uh, there's an English language tab uh, that summarizes a lot of the Taiwan government's work. Uh, one of the things that Taipei has realized was that social distancing does not work on public transit, um, and that instead of doing that, it can be more effective to do a combination of mandatory masks, public temperature checking, ubiquitous contact tracing, um, and, uh, 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 and ubiqu ubiquitous testing uh, in order to get far better public health outcomes than we have here in the United States. One of the questions though for an American culture is what tolerance is there for enforcement of face covering rules? Uh, we don't like rules in the United States, um, but it's going to be uh, necessary if we want to open the economy and not have thousands of people die. Uh, I think it is probably Seoul and Taipei are the best case studies to look at in detail about how we can open our economy safely. Great. Yes, thank you so much for that um, context. It's really helpful. Um, so let me see. I think, you know, next we have here a question from Alex Mirren asking if you can give some specifics on what your system will require and what it will look like when we, you know, if, when, as we start to reopen, um, and especially, you know, hearing from Governor Newsom that we're entering stage two, there's clearly some indications that we're slowly making those steps to reopening the economy. Um, so Bob, if I could start with you um, to answer that question. Yeah, so we are seeing, um, one, I just wanted to add to Jeff's point. Yeah, Taipei and Hong Kong from an Asia perspective, there's some similarities there. They, um, those two systems, their ridership drop um, is, um, close to what some of the Bay Area ridership and, and US uh, systems are. The other two that are out there, and I know this because we're looking at it right now and um, trying to figure out our budget and our ridership. It's a very, very complicated um, 
uh, equation going on are Vienna and Copenhagen. And those two have experienced ridership declines very, very similar. I mean, literally, I'm looking at the three graphs right now, almost mirror images of what BART has and some of the other US. So in addition to Taipei and Hong Kong, the other ones that, you know, the, the operators are looking at, not just the ones on the phone call here, but throughout the United States about um, best practices and lessons learned are the, are the ones in Europe. Um, but a little bit to your question that Kelly on the, uh, what you can expect when BART reopens. So we're already seeing um, uh, um, an, an increase in our ridership. Um, so we've been, you know, we're slowly inching back up, you know, a thousand here, 1500 there. So it's slowly coming back up. Um, I think you can start to see um, from BART's perspective, we have heat maps of the system, um, number of passengers per car and, you know, a number of cars per train. So we have an idea, Kelly, if you and I are out in the system, we know how many people were on our car and how many people were on that train set. And mm -hmm. so we're looking at that and then crosswalking it back to the social distancing. I would agree with Mr. Tomlin unequivocally, you know, the six foot social distancing in public transportation um, is very challenging. And at some point we'll know, um, we've done the math, um, that we're gonna exceed that it's, you know, um, as ridership starts to pick back up. Um, and so we, we need to figure that out, you know, with the, uh, with the face masks and, um, other uh, PPE that we have out there. But, you know, ridership is going to start picking back up. So it, it's complicated because um, there's a couple things. You can just stop me because I'm into this right now with, <laughs> with what I'm doing on our budget and our, our modeling. There's a couple things. It, there's three major underpinnings that we're looking at. It's, it's um, the macroeconomics. It's the economy, you know, and the jobs, right? That's, a huge, that's one leg of the stool. The other leg of the stool is um, the health piece of the thing. You know, what are the health professionals saying and the four stages from the governor? And then the other piece is, you know, how comfortable we are as a society in coming back on. Are you gonna be comfortable, Kelly, or uh, Therese getting on an airplane, you know, with, mm -hmm. you know, 22 inches or two foot of social distancing? Um, so those are the three underpinnings. And so if you look at BART or any transit operator, so there's, you know, at some point you're gonna, you're gonna exceed the six foot. So there's a couple things you can do there, right? Um, the, what we're looking at right now is to provide more service, right? Mm -hmm. And extend the peak hour, right? So I can add additional trains and we're looking at it right now uh, and it, on the shoulders of the peak. And so instead of having, you know, a 90 minute peak, maybe it's a, maybe it's a 120 minute peak or a, you know, a, a two and a half hour peak on the AM and the PM to increase that social distancing and move people through the system. Um, so we're looking at that right now uh, on our modeling efforts um, that and trying to set our budget for the next couple of years here. So, um, and then, you know, we're, we're gonna really um, make sure that we're encouraging, you know, the PPE and the face masking and keeping our system clean and, you know, ordering additional foggers. So we, you know, we're, we want to get to the point where we can fog every train every night. Um, mm -hmm. So, and we're working on that. Um, so, you know, I think you can expect um, uh, some of those differences in the next, you know, 12 months or so. Great. Thank you, Bob. That's really helpful. And answer a few of the other questions that are queuing up into the Q&A. So that's great. Um, so I'm going to, uh, of course, provide all the other um, panelists the opportunity to respond to the question as well. But since we only have a few minutes left here, I wanted to you know, wrap up with our final question. Um, and it's on a bit of a positive note, which I think would be a good way to wrap this up. It's from Darlene G from HNTB. And her question is, amidst all the challenges and negative impacts, what does your agency, agency see as the best opportunities this situation can give us for the future? So I'll start with Seamus. Um, so if you feel free to add any context to the, the, any of the other questions I asked as well. Yeah, thank you. You, you know, I think um, 
in transit, we love standard operating procedures. I think there's a lot of, of businesses and, and industries that uh, that take those to heart and really rely on them. Uh, there, there wasn't an SOP uh, for, for this uh, crisis that we're going through. Uh, there's been a lot of regional coordination, a lot of sharing of ideas. I think it's unprecedented the amount of cooperation that we've seen across systems and throughout the region. And um, I think at the end of this, we're going to develop a good sense uh, for what needs to happen, what um, SOPs we might need to have in place to be able to manage something like this in the future. And I think there's a, a growing consensus that this may not be uh, the only time that we need to deal with an issue like this. Um, some of our um, Asian counterparts that uh, Jeff mentioned have uh, been through this before uh, and they prepared for it. And that's a big reason why they've been able to emerge and recover faster and even uh, prevent the, the spread and the immediate impacts um, when uh, this was in its early stages. So uh, I think if we can uh, learn from that, if we can learn from the experience that we're going through now, if we can prepare um, our regional systems, whether it's uh, our um, operating environments or our transportation uh, finance uh, system and those kind of arrangements uh, at the regional level and maybe at the state level to be able to reflect more uh, of, um, uh, of, of the needs that we have during a crisis like this, that will be a, a really positive thing that can come out of this. Great. That's nice to have some um, opportunity, you know, so think positively about the, you know, this opportunity or this crisis at least. Um, Rick, I'd like to turn over to you for any comments on that. Thanks, Kelly. I think there's there's some positive news here in that there's an opportunity emerging. Should we be willing to, to walk down this path? And, and what I'm getting at is we have all had to, in this short term part of the crisis, the immediate part where we've sheltered in place, things have closed and whatnot, we've had to adjust on the fly. Um, I know that many of my colleagues would echo these comments that we have bent the rules and we have bent them a lot and we have been innovative in bending the rules. And it's interesting how we've responded to this and, and what people have has, re has, has really resonated with folks. And this is from an industry that is highly regulated. Public transit is, is extremely regulated. It oftentimes seems like, you know, if we want to make a change in anything, it's six months and it's a number of dollars. And we have made some changes to our services in a matter of hours or days, and we have survived. And my staff is getting used to that kind of uh, pace, if you will. And I think there's an opportunity coming out of this to learn from that and see how can we take what we've learned in this crisis and use that to increase our flexibility to our transportation systems. Because I think one of the things we were finding before the crisis started was that we were stuck in some things and some decisions that had been made in the past, and they were getting in the way of us moving forward. And I think, I think if we can um, take what we're learning here and apply that post COVID-19, we'll have learned something that has great value into the future. If we decide just to go back and do what we were doing in January and get back there as quickly as we can, we may waste that opportunity, but that's the positive uh, news that I see in this is that we're learning as an industry to become much more flexible. Great. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Therese, would you have, uh, do you have any comments on this as well? Okay. You know, I, I, I want to bring it back maybe to a, a, a broader opportunity that's not just related to public transit, but a critical one I think we all need to think about, which is as, as I had said, uh, the question of who we are and how we survive and work together as a community. I mean, one of the things that has been very clear in this crisis is that it impacts segments of our communities far, far more deeply than others. And inequities, whether they're economic, racial, societal, have been highlighted and, un and I think undeniably are exacerbated under the thumb of this virus. And if people were not on equal footing before the crisis and are being dragged down more as a result of it, we have an opportunity here to really own that and to, with intention, deal with these inequities that are built into our society. Again, this is much bigger than transportation. This is housing, this is jobs, this is everything. But 
there is a unique opportunity as we all have to climb up together to bring everyone together with us. And I, I believe if we don't approach it, I, as I said, with intention, we can lose that opportunity. But I think there's a unique chance for us collectively to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the Bay Area Council is certainly going to be um, working on this, continue to make this a priority, and we will be certain to work together, share all the resources that you all have mentioned during this webinar, and to continue this conversation. You know, there are many questions we did not get to. There's clearly a lot of interest in this topic, um, so we, you know, we really will like to pull some kind of panel or some other type of forum like this together again, so we can continue this conversation. Um, quickly, before I wrap up, I just wanted to see, um, Jeff, uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add on this topic? I think that all of us here have demonstrated that we can get about five years worth of work done in two months. Uh, mm -hmm. Two advantages coming out of this are that it's clear that the regulatory constraints that we're all under are all about stopping change and preserving the privileges of the establishment. And when those rules are thrown out the window in an emergency and we're clear about what our values are, um, we can get an enormous amount done. Um, the other thing is that we, I think, have demonstrated how quickly we can change government agency culture, breaking down pointless hierarchy, siloed thinking. Um, when we're forced to come together as a team to solve a problem, um, we can get an enormous amount of work done and uphold the public good using very, very limited resources. Right. And uh, thank you, and Bob, I also want to make sure to give you the, the opportunity to add any other comments as well. No, uh, um, I, I would echo with what um, Therese McMillan said um, and the opportunities in, in front of us. Um, uh, there is a real set of opportunities here moving forward given this. And I think this, the crisis has really brought the operators in the Bay Area a lot closer together. Um, and we communicate daily, if not, you know, you know three or four or five times a day. Um, so I would echo a lot what uh, Therese was saying. And then I just, I know we're getting short on time here, but I do have, uh, as the BART GM, a question for you, Kelly, and your membership, and whether you answer it now or take it later. I would like to hear from the employers um, mm -hmm. as an operator here, what they're thinking on as the governor's four stages, you know, roll out here what they're thinking about the, their workforce, whether it's big, uh, big employers, small, medium, um, what they're thinking about on uh, the workforce coming back, and you know, a lot of them are telecommuting, is you know, what, what is their thinking there? Um, because it absolutely rolls into my, um, my ridership and our projections and our budget and all of that. So, and as the Bay Area economies go, so does, public transportation as one of our, I think Tumlin said it earlier, and the reverse is also true. So it would be good, I mean, this is a great form. You have all of the businesses um, on this phone call. It'd be good to hear from them what they're thinking about as far as their reopening piece, because it crosswalks into our worlds here. And you know, a lot of their employees are riding our systems. And I'd like to hear a little bit from them, you know, what they're thinking. Great. No, that's a, a great and really important point, Bob. And I, I believe we are working on a survey now to send out to our members to ask exactly those questions. And so, you know, that kind of collaboration and sharing that information is something we'll certainly work on because um, we think that is a very crucial part of, you know, our job, our role as the Bay Area, as the Bay Area Council is to work together with all yes. of you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that we are right on time. Um, so, you know, thank you. A huge thank you to all the speakers. Um, for sharing all the information and your time. Um, this was immensely helpful and we really appreciate it. Um, you know, we, again, we apologize that we didn't get to, you know, get to all the questions, but we will continue to do series like this and, and we'll be planning another one focused on public transit in the near future. Um, just a quick reminder that we will be following up to this webinar um, with a link to the recorded webinar and as well as any of the resources that have been mentioned. Um, and of course, please feel free if you have, um, you know, anything you'd like to share, uh, you can always go to the Barry Council. We have a COVID-19 resource page where we've been sharing a lot of information about the response from our agencies and also what our employers have been doing. Um, so, you know, we are here for you. Please feel free to follow up if you um, have any other follow-up questions. So thank you to everyone, and please have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.